This episode of Live WP TV is sponsored by the Microsoft Nerd Center in Cambridge and HostGator.com. Um, so I want to talk today about web design and how we conceptualize web design and how we actually go about it. And I spent uh, most of the last 20 years working in agencies of various kinds, so doing web design and development and content management platforms for other people, right, as an agent for other people. And a whole lot of our conception of how we do web design, I would argue, has taken from its heritage in print, right? We talk about designing pages, we talk about the home page as though it's the cover of a magazine, and then we talk about how we organize content from that metaphor. I want to think a little bit today about web design from the context of urban design, uh, city design. And uh, started, uh, I want to start us with a, uh, the thought about Robert Moses and Jane Jacobs. So mid-20th century Manhattan, there's a sort of dramatic conflict between Jane Jacobs here on the left and Robert Moses here on the right that's now being memorialized in an opera. And when I gave this presentation a year ago, the opera was still untitled. But now it's been titled. It's called The Marvelous Order, and they've been giving various demonstrations about it uh, or uh, exhibitions about the opera. So you can find some good video online at MosesJacobsOpera.com. The core kind of uh, argument that goes on between Moses and Jacobs is that Moses is the, the predominant example of heavy, centralized urban planning. Cut big, giant freeways through the center of Manhattan so that we can get car traffic through more effectively. In fact, this uh, little animation that they're showing here is what was going to be the Lower Manhattan Expressway cutting right through Washington Square Park. So you see little cars running right under the Arc de Triomphe uh, in Washington Square Park. Jacobs, uh, so, you know, Moses comes out of the school of thought of Baron von Hausmann in Paris, right? Uh, our materials are what's important. Don't worry about existing residential neighborhoods that are in the way. We'll just you know, take them over by eminent domain, raise them to the ground, and put up freeways. That's a fairly critical reading of Moses. There are other people who would be much more positive about him. But it's command and control, top-down, centralized organization. Jacobs, on the other hand, buys a, a home at uh, 555 Hudson Street in the village, uh, lives there with her family, spends a lot of her time in her office looking out the second floor window of her, of her apartment and watching the street life that happens in the village. And so she writes The Death and Life of Great American Cities. She ends up opposing uh, Moses' plan and essentially saving Greenwich Village for all of us to enjoy now. The, thing, the key thing that I want to take away from Jacobs is this. There is a quality even meaner than outright ugliness or disorder. So there's something worse than ugliness or disorder. It's the dishonest, max, it's the dishonest mask of pretended order achieved by ignoring or suppressing the real order that is struggling to exist and be served. So she's talking about experiencing the city as a pedestrian. She's talking about mixed-use residential neighborhoods. She's talking about the ability to actually interact with the real vibrant nature of the people who live in the city. Instead of coming at it top-down, she's talking about coming at it bottom-up and letting locals decide what happens in their neighborhoods. And I think there's a metaphor for web design, which is when it comes to web design, we're doing it wrong. In fact, we've been doing it wrong for some time. We have taken the Moses approach. I would argue, in fact, we've been doing it wrong for a very long time. Right? Uh, John Elsop famously wrote in the Tao of Web Design, now is the time for the medium of the web to outgrow its origins in the printed page. The web's greatest strength, I believe, is often seen as a limitation. It is the nature of the web to be flexible, and it should be our role as designers and developers to embrace this flexibility. Now, I know that sounds very modern. What year did he write this? Anybody remember? Am I the only old timer in the room? Anyone want to guess? The 90s? 90s, not quite. 75? April 7th, 2000. So 16 years ago, right? This is still the argument that I have on a regular basis with clients today. The web is not print, it is not a page. How wide is a web page? How many of you have heard that? How wide is the page? And I say, well, it depends on what device that you're on, right? Well, how wide should it be? Well, that's not up to you. That's up to me because I decide what to look at it on and how big that window is, right? 
um, we're still kind of struggling with this notion that, that web pages are not pages in the traditional sense. So part of the answer here is responsive web design. Ethan Marcotte, one of our keynotes from WordCamp Boston two years ago, three years ago now, um, a very smart uh, New Englander, Bostonian or New Hampshire resident. Responsive design is certainly part of the answer. So build your pages in a way that's responsive, uh, use media queries, use flexible images, right? Uh, make a page that is viewable on any device. That's certainly a lot of a goal. I remember living through the moment which web design agencies went from, could we possibly do this responsive, to why on earth would you ever make a site that wasn't responsive, right? And still find sites that we go into redesign that were built two years ago that are not responsive, but don't find any built in the last year, right? So 16 years later, we finally have answered John Alpsop's call and are making sites responsive. Another part of the answer is content strategy. Uh, Karen McGrain, who wrote Content Strategy for Mobile. If you get nothing out of the talk other than those two books, the last one and this one, you will have earned the price of admission. Um, very smart thinker about detaching your content from the specific mode in which it's going to be rendered and stop thinking about writing web pages and think about the content that you're producing and all of the destinations in which it might be encountered. Think about structuring your content so that it's better prepared for the coming mobile apocalypse in which more people will view your web pages on phones than they will on devices, on computers. If that isn't already the case, which it may be for some of you. We put them together and bring in Jeffrey Zeldman. The answer is to design from the bottom up, which means from the content out. So I'm gonna talk about three themes today. First is designing with content, second is from the bottom up, and the third is systems, not pages. So what do I mean by design with content? For a long time, we have treated design as though you do design and then you pour content into it. This is a fundamental flaw that goes back to PageMaker 1.0. It probably goes back further than that. But it means that we don't think about content and design at the same time. So death to warm ipsum, and bacon ipsum, and hipster ipsum, and veggie ipsum, and Trump ipsum, and all the other ipsums. Lorem Ipsum is synthetic content. These are uh, synthetic humans from the AMC show. So only one of those people is a real human. Um, it looks like content, and it looks enough like content that it fools us into thinking we have actually thought about content. But we haven't. It's like spam. It's not really food. It's enough food-like that people can forget that it's not actually food. And the problem with Lorem Ipsum, there are several. One of them is that Lorem Ipsum is so nice because it conveniently fits into every space that we make for it because it's not real content, right? So how many times have you looked at the design of a site in a comp especially, and this usually happens in comps, not in live sites, and you see repeated nine times the same story. They all have exactly the same length headline. They all have exactly the same thumbnail picture. They all have exactly the same number of profile, field, profile fields. Nobody's name is longer or shorter than anybody else's. None of this works in the real world. How often do you see this in the real world in which someone's uh, actual content has been flowed into a design that was not prepared for it and instead you've got a jumbled mess? <coughs> that comes from designing with lorem ipsum. Little side note on lorem ipsum. People think lorem ipsum is made up. It's not. It's actually a corrupted text from uh, the Bonibus Fidibum from Cicero. It's on Good and Evil by Cicero. And this is actually the key part. Nor again is there anyone who loves or pursues or desires to obtain pain of itself because it is pain, <laughs> but because occasionally circumstances occur in which toil and pain pro can procure him some great pleasure. I love this because it means buried deep in every corporate infrastructure is a little bit of a discourse on hedonism from Cicero. And also because this is one of those circumstances in which toil and pain will give you great pleasure. Taking the time to develop your content strategy first and understand what your content is will, in fact, make design more pleasurable. It will be toil, but you will get there. So I already can hear, what if your client doesn't have content, right? This is the number one question. And there are a couple of answers. One is wait. Tell them you're waiting. I will be happy to start design on this client the minute that you tell me what the content of the site is. Right? Now, hopefully you're having this as a conversation. It's not just them throwing content over the wall. You're involved in defining requirements and having conversations about business goals and KPIs and all that. 
but you can wait. It's one we are very reluctant to use. Instead, we want to get started. This is like having your construction crew start building your house before you've engaged an architect or a site planner. Right? Let's just start building something, and hopefully something good will come out of it, and then we'll adjust as we go instead of having a plan up front. But you don't have to just wait. Another thing you can do is use proto-content. And there's a talk that Travis Cox did at uh, WordCamp Minneapolis in 2015 called Designing with Proto-Content. That's a great, has a great set of, of sort of recommendations in it. So if you're redesigning, and in 2016, it's fairly rare that you're actually building an entirely new product that has absolutely no existence in digital yet, right? There may be a few of those still. Use the site's current content. You know what the future site content is most likely to be like? The current site's content. It will be more like the current site's content than it will be like anything else. I know people think they have grand plans for how their content is going to be transmogrified and, and dramatically changed, but there's, not, there's uh, very good odds that it will be a lot like the site's current content. It may change. Every single word of it may be rewritten, but in its texture, in the sort of weft and weave of the language and the kinds of content that they produce, it will probably be very similar. Write your own. That's a scary one for some of us, I know. Nothing gets a client to react more quickly that that isn't the right content than putting content I wrote in front of them. Um, and I have a PhD in literature, but still I can't write. Use text from competitors' websites. Caution. One of the things that happens with Lauren Mipsum, if you spend uh, some time Googling some of the phrases from Lauren Mipsum, is that it ends up in production. <laughs> we call this content leakage, right? Because people forget to replace it. The same thing happens if you use text from your competitors' websites. At least twice in the last year, I have come across sites using paragraphs stolen entirely from tenup.com, like just dramatically, even with the images associated with them. Generally, when we reach out, it's because something's in the process of being designed and they've started as inspiration, right? Or at least that's what they tell us and I choose to believe them. <laughs> uh, use real content from another context. The Gutenberg Project, open source books, right? Science. Find something generally in the industry that you're in that has free content available for your content restrictions and use it. At least it will have some of the real texture. The reality is this is sort of what Laura Mipsum was originally for. If you go back to typesetting, they wanted to have some type to use to set as kind of sample and filler. The problem is the way we've chosen to use it more than it is the actual Laura Mipsum. And the fact that we're not writing Latin, so it's hardly said to be representative. So uh, use real content in your design. Corollary to this, I said there were only the three I lied, there's three plus of one A. Use real content, including ads. We work a lot uh, with magazines and publications that are ad monetized. You cannot design a media publication or a digital property that's going to be ad monetized and then shove the ads in at the end. Because <coughs> when you do, you get this, right? Failing to plan is planning to fail. Design with actual ads. We'll pull ads right off their current live site and embed them in comps, right? You want people to see what the site is actually going to be like. It's not going to be a pristine one in which an art director has carefully chosen an aspirational ad for Audi on every page, right? It's going to be the crap you're getting from OpenX or from Ad Exchange or from Google, whatever. Use the real ads that you're going to be using. Does, theme two, designing from the bottom up. I know it's a little disorienting to look at a tree upside down, but it all makes sense in a moment. When we design websites, we think about them from the home page down. We think about web experiences, and you think about going through design phases with stakeholders. You always start with the home page. It's the one thing that's guaranteed in every design contract I've ever seen, is that the home page will be designed. Maybe not all the other pages on the site, but at least we're going to see a comp of the home page, right? Maybe you fall back then to section pages, right? So sort of the pages for every major topic, those are kind of the seconded priorities because there might be a few different things for that. And then maybe you get to an article page as the third. What we really ought to do is do this in exactly the opposite order. Where do people spend most of the time on your site? On the leaf pages, on the notes, on the articles, on the events, on the forum threads, right? That's where they're actually going to come into your site, pardon me, for the most part, through social. People rarely come in through the front door anymore. They're generally coming in through a side door. It's also where you have many, many more pages, right? So there's only one home page. Well, in theory, there's only one home page. There are exceptions to that rule as well. But there are going to be millions of article pages, right? 
So why do we keep starting with the facade of the building instead of starting with the rooms we're actually going to spend time in? Third theme is to design systems, not pages. So when you think about a system, and this is Starling Splocking, there's a great article on blocking behavior. If you're a computer programmer of a certain age, you may have actually built this simulation before as kind of a screensaver. It's a fun thing to program when you're learning. The beautiful behavior of flocking birds comes from three very simple rules followed in order. First rule is separation. Don't get too close to your neighbors. We call it short range repulsive. Right? You don't want to hit the bird next to you. So you need to stay far enough away to retain safety. Second, bearing in mind number one, alignment. Steer toward the average heading of your neighbors. So you're going roughly the same way your other your neighbors are going. And then third is cohesion which is, in general, steer toward where the other birds are, right? So you have to keep track of this sort of short-term repulsion and long-range attraction. If we think about our systems of design as systems of components assembled together, think about how web pages are actually built, right? Small elements of HTML with CSS attached to them are assembled together into HTML documents or HTML responses we should be designing more like we're consuming. We should be designing from a systematic point of view and thinking about how each of these elements is going to interact with the elements that are around it in the multiple contexts in which that is going to be seen. So as we moved into responsive web, we broke the assumption that you're always going to be looking at a desktop viewport, but we still said, let's start from that, and then let's figure out how to kind of move stuff around as the, as the uh, viewport changes instead of actually starting from the items that are going to make up what's in that viewport and then assembling them back up into pages. Style tiles, uh, which actually came out of the Drupal community, um, it's style T-I-L dot E-S if you're looking for the site, was the first kind of strong presentation that I saw of this idea, which basically said, instead of presenting to clients <coughs> pictures of web pages, which are static comps of home page and then section pages and on down, present style tiles that are a bit more like a mood board. They're sort of somewhere in between a mood board and a mock-up. They show the typography that's going to be used. They show the relationship between different elements and sort of what that's going to feel like. They show the, the kind of imagery that's going to be used, whether it's photography or illustration or whatever. They show the texture of what the experience is going to be like as a set of smaller components that are then going to be assembled into pages. And if you think about the kinds of revisions that designs usually go through, it's an awful lot of moving those components around. It's actually very little of changing the underlying components themselves. So once you've got a style tile complete, then you can start to assemble some pages in, in the real world. Next step forward here is thinking about design systems like Google's material design. So material design, I think, is a fantastic marketing effort on behalf of Google. I think they've spent maybe more time marketing the system than actually designing it at this point. But what they have done is created a very kind of cohesive language for how certain kinds of applications work across multiple platforms that has real intention and real weight and comes out of a sort of metaphor from the real world. Another one, this is uh, from Uber. The contrast works out not so well here. Um, increasingly, companies like Uber are starting to think about design systems across all of their manifestations. So this is a little bit more than the old brand guideline. You can use the logo this way, you can't use the logo this way. It starts to get into things like how typography interacts, how maps should be rendered, across all of the different kinds of places that you're going to interact with the brand. The best reference here is a book that's still emerging. Right? So I started with kind of John Alsop and then uh, Responsive Design and Content Strategy. The best book on modular design right now, I think, is the Atomic Design book, which will be a book by Brad Frost. Um, you can actually read it in process as it's being developed. So I did my PhD in American Literature. I was a culture guy before I became a developer. Brad takes the metaphor of science. Right? So he goes back to kind of high school science, or maybe it's college science for him, I don't know. But atoms, which build up into molecules, which build up to organisms, and then he kind of breaks out of the science metaphor into templates and pages. But so you think about your actual smallest element as an atom, right? And uh, there's lots of great examples on his site. 
an atom might be a form field. And it gets built up into a molecule, which is a label and the associated form field. And then it gets built up into an organism, which is an actual form, which is a collection of form fields and, and, and their labels. And then you build those modules up into pages, right? Now, for Brad, pages are specific instances of templates that replace placeholder content with real representative content. So Brad is a little bit more open to lorem ipsum than I am. Um, there's some good uh, writing inside Atomic Design about why he accepts kind of the notion that you can use lorem ipsum. He says you don't even need to know the representative content until you're at the point where you have pages. So you've taken all your atoms and assembled them into to organisms, and now you're looking at them in pages. And he says it is at the page stage that we're able to take a look at all of those patterns hold up when real content is applied to the design system. This is the only place where I argue with Brad, because otherwise he's brilliant. I think this is too late to be applying real content to your design system. You've got to be applying real content to your design system throughout, right, for it to make any sense. Otherwise, you're going to design molecules and components and organisms that are dysfunctional when your real content engages with them. We need to be able to see the forest and the tree. So you need to be able to go back and forth between I'm designing micro components. I'm thinking about how headlines and subheads are going to interact with each other. I'm thinking about how my type is going to render in various contexts. I'm thinking about what lists of related posts are going to look like. Right? And I'm thinking about these at a very atomic level. And I'm also assembling them into pages and looking at what that looks like as a cohesive experience across multiple devices. And I've got to be able to go back and forth between those multiple times in order to really build a successful design. So back to Jane. This is where they ended up getting the title The Marvelous Order from, which I love because it's already in my deck. Uh, this order is all composed of movement and change. We may fancifully call it the art form of the city and liken it to dance. It's an intricate ballet in which the individual dancers and ensembles all have distinctive parts, which reinforce each other and compose an orderly whole. That's a better model for a successful design system for a digital experience something in which all of the parts are resonating and interacting with each other in proportional balance, but it isn't achieved by starting with static home pages, designing from the top down with lorem ipsum, and then hoping to jam content in at the end and, and achieve some kind of success. The journey begins by letting go of control and becoming flexible. I think the reason we still resist understanding this about the way that web pages work we know it's how they're actually built. We know it's how the technology actually works. We know it's how they're actually going to end up. Your site, no matter how you design it, is always going to end up being composed of a bunch of modules of smaller pieces. But we're reluctant to accept it because we think it's relinquishing control. The reality is it's relinquishing control we never had. Right? The digital experience is never controlled by the designer. This is the reality of the way the web works, and it's something we need to embrace. So design with real content, banish lower mipsum, design from the bottom up, start from the lowest page in the site hierarchy, start from the individual page, think about that experience worst because that's first because that's where people will spend the most time, and then get back to the pages that collect that data and aggregate it and source it into home pages. And design systems, not pages. Think about modular components that are going to interact. For some people, this means going all the way to a pattern library and code that can be shared across development teams with this is how you properly format a list and here's the CSS for it. For other people, that means more like kind of snippets of design that are shared in design state. Either way, think about them systematically rather than thinking just about pages. So I'm John Ackman. I'm the CEO at 10UP. We do strategy design and engineering. Uh, we are also hiring. So if you're a qualified WordPress developer, project manager, user experience person, designer, come talk to me. And uh, this slide deck has a bunch of resources in it at the end. It is on SlideShare. If you go to slideshare.net slash J Ekman, Jekman, all one word, that's where all of my slides are. You can find that version. This version will be on the web because Tom posts them to YouTube very quickly. Or you can find the version of the talk that I gave at WordCamp for Ireland, which is slightly longer and, uh, but otherwise very similar. And with that, I'll take questions. Sorry, I can't see your oh, yes. slide there. Can you spell your last name? Yes, slideshare.net slash J.
J-E-C-K-M-A-N. On slideshare.net. I mean, I think you need content experts, whether they're writers, whether they're editors, somebody who is close to the kind of content that is going to exist on the site, involved in that design process from the beginning. It's harder for you as the writer, in the sense that the client ultimately needs to be the one who makes this decision, but you might suggest it. So one of the things that we often find is there's a, there's a sort of cart and horse problem with content and design. Designers want to say, I'll do all the design and then we'll add content to it. But that doesn't work. At the same time, you often can't really say, let's finish all of the content and then do design, because they interact with each other. So the way that I describe this, and clients understand this because it's project management terminology, there's a finish to finish dependency. The content can't really be complete until the design is complete. Because the design is going to change what kind of content is most effective. At the same time, the design can't really be complete until we have enough content to understand what's possible, right? And the two need to work with each other. So I want a designer having access to representative content, and hopefully more than just representative content, early in the process before they start sketching. And then I want the writer, content editor, strategist, whatever it is, engaged in reviewing those designs as they start to come together. For us, that actually starts first in a wireframing process, which I didn't even get into here, but it's the same thing. Those wireframes are also driven by real content, right? Content priority is the thing that should drive what's happening in those. And of course, it has to all be connected to business strategy, which hopefully the client can represent or, or some other strategy. Yeah, in the back first, and then we'll come up here. Um, I was wondering if you could um, apply the, or address the kind of approach you're, at, you're advocating in graphic UI terms to the question of site structure <coughs> and information architecture. Because mm -hmm. um, I think that would be, I'm, I'm curious how you would do that in terms of like, uh, design the leaf pages first. Yeah. So certainly when you think about the, the sort of traditional information architecture representation of a site map, it tends to sort of start with a couple of high-level category pages and often there's one further down that sort of stacks multiple deep and it says that's the article page, right? But if you look at what information architects are actually doing, they're typically doing a pretty good content inventory and understanding the content types and the relationships between them. So I would argue they're actually already thinking about those sort of loose pages first. I think the trick is when you get into sort of wireframing, not letting your sort of totalizing vision of the relationships between all of these things that you are already thinking about be what actually drives the experience. Instead, start with some of that more local experience. Sometimes this comes down to, you know, getting actual content in order to experience are the relationships that we thought we saw in the content the things that actually make sense to the end users, or are they things that we just think are related? So we know we're going to have feature requests, but why? Well, because we know we want to feature things. Well, that's such a backwards way to think about what are we actually accomplishing for the user. If it's about serendipity, if it's about discovery, then maybe a different metaphor is useful. But I think the, the sort of the site architecture stuff in some ways already does a better job of thinking about all those node pages because they have to think about pathways to get to all of them and they have to think about sort of where they live in a hierarchy. <coughs> I do think sort of, I mean, one cheap answer which I've explored before is just taking all our site maps and turning them upside down, right? So that they don't start with the big square box for the homepage, but they actually start with these nodes and, and look where they go. Not sure that would really be revolutionary, but it feels like it might be a nice adjustment. It's kind of like when you first explore cartography and you see a map that's flipped, that has north and south flipped, and you sort of go, oh, <laughs> like, I've never thought about that assumption, right? And I think that, that sort of built into our IA structures as well. We'll come up front, you sir. What, um, what are resources for imaging? Cooper would be a great place to grab ready text or running Written content, what are the sources for pictures and 
So it, it, it really can vary by vertical. I mean, often with our clients, we're talking about custom photography because we're talking about stuff that's unique to them, right? So I mean, I'd want to do a photo shoot first and foremost so I can art direct it to figure out what the, what the right approach is. But if you're looking more in the public domain, uh, Unsplash, if you just Google best sources for Creative Commons or copyright-free images, there are actually lots these days. Um, five years ago, that was a hard question to answer. These days, there are at least four or five that I have seen that are decent sources of video um, un or of uh, images. What can be tricky is if what you want is dramatic scenic vistas of nature or cityscapes, those areas are well served. If what you need is, uh, you know, shiny, happy people in a conference room writing on a whiteboard. Those areas are well served by commercial stock photography, which you can purchase. But if what you really need is something that's specific to your business, right, um, doing some actual location photography yourself is probably a better way. And again, it comes back to sort of stock photography is the visual equipment of, equivalent of lorem ipsum. It's sort of <laughs> close enough to real imagery that it works. But often it reads very clearly as stock and, and, and fails to differentiate you, and, and that's a whole other story. Nonetheless, good sources for starting with content in the design stage if you don't have it yet. Yes. So the, the, a mood board is lower fidelity than a style tile, in the sense that typically a mood board just has kind of textures we might explore, and it's more oriented toward, are we thinking modern and clean, or are we thinking organic and, and fussy and traditional, right? It's sort of earlier in the process. And an actual comp that's a specific page is a more realized version, so style tiles kind of fit in the middle. They're more specific to your site than just a mood board because we really are saying, here's the actual typography we're gonna use, here's the actual colors that we're gonna use, here's the actual relationships between sizes and spaces that we're gonna use. But they're not yet arranged as a page, so they're not yet giving you that impression of a single page. because they can be very kind of vapid and empty, right? Um, so the right words can be more valuable than the wrong picture, I guess is the way that I would say it. Um, I don't know how much time I should take questions, Tom. Uh, take like two more. Okay, we'll do two more. You have your hand up for a while. In, uh, in the concept of uh, responsive design, yep. what typically drives the content? Is it the smaller screen or the larger screen? So. It should be the smaller screen from my perspective. So there's a whole argument, uh, mobile first is the phrase that it goes by, Luke Robluski, whose name I won't even try to spell. I'm sorry, but I can't spell Robluski. Uh, has a book called uh, Mobile First. The reason why we start with clients in a mobile first context is because it forces priority. So on a big expansive desktop homepage, especially if you're starting at 1200 wide or even 1600 wide, which some people do these days, there's a lot of space. And there's a lot of feeling like we can have everything, so we don't need to make hard decisions about what belongs where because we can just put it all on the home page, right? Uh, starting from mobile first sort of forces that because you're forced into a smaller viewport and you're forced to make some harder decisions. And then the real question is, if we don't need that stuff on mobile, do we really need it on the desktop? Or could we actually have a cleaner space with more white space and more experience and let it breathe? Some clients struggle with that because they also still want the desktop home page first. And so when I tell a team that's designed in the order that makes sense and present in the order that's consumable, so start your wireframes mobile first and then present them desktop first. And if you get pushback on the desktop wireframes that they don't seem full enough, jump to mobile and explain why, right? One more, yeah. When at, at setup, when you're designing more for systems instead uh -huh. of for pages, does the client-side framework that you use influence the 
the way you think about the systems that you're designing? So the, the most honest answer is it shouldn't, but yes, it does, right? So there's a little bit of leakage there. Um, in the, and, and what I mean by leakage is in the traditional sense, you want design to be to, to a significant degree independent of the framework in which it's going to be rendered. I think the reality is in the web, <laughs> it's like sculptors pretending that they're not working in clay. We are working in the web. We are working in HTML and CSS. And so our uh, sort of vision is design isn't complete until I can touch it, taste it, feel it in a browser on devices, right? So the comp, whatever, the style tile, any other representation isn't real until I'm actually experiencing HTML and CSS. Where I would draw the line, though, is it shouldn't get down to sort of the very specific details of SAS versus SCSS or Compass or, you know, it shouldn't get down to that level. Certainly the fact that we're building a site in WordPress, for example, is something we're going to know and we're going to think about if it's known at that point because it's going to impact how we think about how those modules come together. And we're going to try not to design, I'm going to mix metaphors here, we're going to try not to design an organism that's going to break across some natural higher level order. So a custom post site that has some fields that actually live in some other part of the information architecture mixed together in a module. So we're going to be aware of it. But it shouldn't drive the design. It should be sort of accommodated by as we think about the design coming together. I don't know if that quite answers. But is there a JavaScript framework that you prefer to set up versus the others? There isn't one that I prefer. Um, I suspect if you asked five front-end developers that set up that same question, you would get 10 different answers. Um, we have not standardized to that degree. There is, in our engineering best practices doc, whole section on CSS and JavaScript and frameworks that you're welcome to check out, but we haven't put our official stamp on one approach. Great, thank you all.